Isaac, thank you for the, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and also, what I have to do is, I'm Jewish, it's my Sabbath, I consider this um, holy work, but I will always try to honour my gratitude to Catholic social thought, which is... It's like being an academic, you know. <laughs> Um, which has really changed my life, shaped the way that I view politics. So, you know, I'm very suspicious of this word faith because it mingles up and mangles up a lot of different things. So I would say that the politics that I'm talking about is fundamentally formed through the prism of Catholic social thought. But being Jewish, it's got a very strong emphasis on the Bible, on ideas of jubilee um, concepts from there which I will I will talk about and it's just to say that you know politics so I'm not talking about Rishi Sunak and I'm not talking about Keir Starmer I have really no interest in who's up who's down but when we talk about politics we are talking in our country also about the kingdom about how do we live together how do we live together under shared laws, shared institutions? And to say that this relationship with politics is absolutely fundamental to how we live. I really agreed with Zohar this morning on many points, but one point in particular that he was talking about is, you know, this idea that we can withdraw from politics. Um, the idea that we you know, can build a Benedictine isolation in our urban centres. You know, Leon Trotsky, to give one example, said, you may not be interested in the revolution, but the revolution is interested in you, right? So you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you, and it comes at you, comes at your children, comes at your parents. <laughs> There's no es escape from it. So I think it's important to understand that when we talk about politics, we're talking about really demons and angels, right? Politics is capable of being demonic, coercive, violent, oppressive in extreme forms. Not just Trotsky, by the way, but, you know, the Russian Revolution, that type of coercive power is also politics. But politics is also fundamentally the way that we can, not quite to verbatim quote Sarah, but exactly how can we align a flourishing life and a common life within the framework of the, of the common good. So it's a, it's a fundamental thing. How do we live this life and what is our relationship with politics? I'm going to stay pretty clear of, of party politics and partly because I think we're living in a in a time of absolute oh thank you wow I can actually refer to my notes <laughs> and, and stop improvising in quite such a way um thank you oh that's great oh not bad I've, I've followed uh, a few points uh, <laughs> Um, I think there's a massive uh, disaffection with party politics, a sense of drift, a sense of fear and, and abandonment. So I want to address that. And just to say how I orientate myself and try to, to live a life that's consistent um, with my faith in politics. And one of the beautiful things about Catholic social thought is that it's fallen. It's not a messianic politics, it's a fallen uh, politics. That comes very much from the Dominican tradition and through which it was. I mean, here in England, uh, Cardinal Manning was one of the chief proponents and architects of this thought. Don't forget his support for the dock strike. And don't forget that he did that in alliance with William Booth from the Salvation Army. And if you read at the time, the outrage about this was not because they were defending workers. 
it was because Protestants were aligned with Catholics for the common... This was considered completely... We forget about this and we forget about that division. But it was a sublime manifestation. I do believe that the origins of my party, the Labour Party, was found in that coalition between Catholic and Protestant workers. In order to broach a common good, you found that in the cooperative movement which was the first movement that buried Catholics and Protestants in the same graveyards under the same auspices. These are things that we tend to forget, but are extremely important aspects um, of our common history. So, you know, politics is the ultimate form of association. This is where we are. How do we live together? How do we live together non-violently? That's the fundamental, how do we um, accept the, the constraints of that? And I'm going to explore some of that. Just, unfortunately, as well as being a politician, I'm also an academic. So this is what Isaac said to me. I said, he said, how long are you going to speak for? I said, oh, about 20 minutes. He said, oh, a little longer. Never say that. <laughs> to, <coughs> never say that to an academic and certainly don't say that to a politician. But just, just to say that the politics that I'm advocating really does follow um, Aristotle in viewing us as social beings in that sense. It's very consistent with the fundamental assumptions of Catholic social thought and I think of the Bible that we are, that we, that we are social beings and what does that mean? We're longing for love and we're longing for friendship, and we're longing for meaningful work, that we have a longing for that. And we have to recognise that the, the existing structures of society, both in capitalism and the state, are opposed to those things. They maximise individual careers, the maximisation of your time and your um, earning potential. That's the incentives device within capitalism but the state is also an enormous menace because it's isolating it views you as an individual citizen outside of relationships all these care programs and career pathways and they don't do anything whatsoever to cultivate relationships and what is meaningful um, in life it's also consistent you know with the bible it is not good to be alone it says in the early stages of genesis and that's just something uh, to bear in mind. So how do I approach this? I approach this, as I say, as viewing the world as absolutely full of demons and angels, that there's a menace and possibility. So it's a matter of judgment about, about where you are. So I want to talk about the general orientation. Um, so the first, and I guess the most important for me, is that um, God created the world. That's where we start. Um, he, he created the heaven and the earth. He created human beings and nature. Um, so I, I used to be very, very criticised in labour for working with religious people because you're all a bunch of <laughs> sexual perverts and or patriarchs and authoritarians. I'd say, yeah, maybe so, but... <laughs> I said, but at least they don't think the free market created the world. <laughs> right? That, you know, these are the judgments I said you've, you've got to make, which was always followed not by laughter, but by kind of perplexed anger, a silent, mm. and then of course Labour would say, no, the state created the world, you know, mistake, big, big mistake. So we have an inheritance of something sacred. Nature is sacred and every human being is sacred. So that's the beginning of the orientation. Now, what does that mean in political terms? The first thing it means, and once again, apologies, so Rad, for cribbing your talk, but I did get up early and I did come. Um, so I could say, in a Lockean term, I mixed my labour with you. Uh, um, we, we are not commodities. You know, the big question in politics is what is a commodity? Now, a commodity is something that's open for sale on the market at fluctuating prices, right? And so when we talk about a labour market, we're talking about a market in human beings. But it's all smothered. When we're talking about 
land and food markets. We're talking about nature and the necessities of life. When we talk about property markets, which is the foundation of our economy, we're talking about a home in the world where you can live and be protected from the elements and have some kind of stability. So this, we have lived through, I would say, 40 to 50 years. I'm going to date it when it really started. I think it started in 1979, this era of merciless commodification of human life and nature, which goes under the heading of globalization. That's what it, you know, that there's no, nothing you can do about price formation and the intensification. So care for the elderly becomes commodified. Huge aspects of our lives, where we live, how we earn, all, all of that is commodification. So I want to say that the starting point of my politics is to say, okay, human beings are not commodities. Nature is not a commodity. Ultimately, a home is not a commodity. These are energy and heat are not, strictly speaking, commodities because they are necessary for human life and human flourishing. So, so the alignment of life with the common life which you were talking about today, is absolutely uh, central to this. But we have to be aware of sin. And so in confronting the forces that wish to commodify our existence, to destroy relationships and mutuality in, in favour of a kind of madcap individualism, we have to recognise that resistance to that can go very badly. And then I go back to the Soviet Union, then I go back to state, the worship of state power, which is equally sinful to the worship of money power. So central to this are ideas that I think are found in, in Catholic social thought. And, you know, I just wish to outline those very quickly. Isaac, how long have I got? You see, <laughs> time goes quickly when you're enjoying yourself. Uh, OK, so I'm going to begin with just four basic standpoints through which I organise my politics following Catholic social thought. Um, and I'm going to do it in an alliterative way where every word begins with S. OK, so I'm going to begin with the concept of status which is also the idea of dignity, the dignity of the worker, which is absolutely central to what Manning was talking about. Now, why does capitalism threaten the dignity of the worker? Because it tries to turn the worker into a commodity. And, it, and capital, the accumulation of money, is an extremely powerful force in the economy that pushes enormous constraints on the worker. Uh, so I got an email from Michael Lind yesterday, he sent me a, a piece in American Compass with this incredible fact that in the United States, over the past 50 years, the real value of labour, wages, has increased by 1%, and corporate profits by 185%. Well, that's the only stat I'm going to give you. But that tells the whole story. The capital money power is a mighty force. We've had the decline of uh, trade unions, of associations, of guilds, of the very idea of vocation itself. So central to the politics that I'm talking about is this idea of vocation, of the dignity of labour, and just to let you know, I'm a politician, I'm going to lie to you and give you another stat, yeah, which is in 1976, seven percent of the population went to university and 50 percent of the population did a form of apprenticeship. It's not perfect symmetry, but now 50 percent go to university and five percent do an apprenticeship. So this neglect of the embed, embedded, embodied person who skillfully performs their work, not exclusively 
for money, but the effective fulfillment of their practice, of their trade, has been obliterated by globalization. So the restoration of the dignity of the worker, and I think we've got to talk, Isaac, with Lady of Ransom, uh, about the restoration of vocation, about the dignity of vocation, and actually be prepared to talk about guilds and the restoration of associations which uphold virtue. And virtue I define as good doing rather than do-gooding. Right, it, a virtue is a skillful practice performed. Now, thank God we've got a priest in the room, that's a vocation. But what I'm saying is being a plumber is a vocation, being a teacher is a vocation. There are internal goods associated with that that lead to an attitude to time that's not exclusively profit maximising. I hope I know it's a Saturday afternoon and I'm sorry to be talking in that language, but it's vital that we understand that if we are to live in the world according to our faith, then we have to respect vocation and work as a good rather than exclusively as a means to external goods. And what are external goods? Money, fame, power. Those are the external goods. And you see this all the time, for example, this is the paradox of everything. So in football, for example, footballers now earn huge amounts of money. They're hugely famous. And yet every club has to try and resist that and create some kind of team, some kind of collective bond, some kind of sacrifice. Imagine how liberals struggle to understand the word sacrifice, but it's very, very, very important. So, um, the, so the status of the person in the workplace is, is where I begin my judgments and energy. Now, once again, to learn from the sin, the idea is not a state directed control of the economy but something much closer to distributism, something much closer to things that Chesterton was talking about. That is, So that leads to the next point, which is um, a really long and ugly word, but I think it's an important word, which is subsidiarity, which is that power should be exercised at the lowest level, commensurate with its effective function. That we have to have a far more decentralised thing. So the church structure gives us the lead in this, which is that the church structure is based on parish and place. That it's embedded and embodied in a place. And what capitalism and statism does is it wishes to eliminate place through the establishment of pure procedural justice, that everybody is equal, everybody is the same, that it doesn't matter, and we've got the internet now, so you don't have to live anywhere. You can earn your living on the internet with no relationship with neighbours, no relationships with place. I'm saying that this is, this is a fantasy world, and it only favours the centralisation of elite power. That when we talk about distributism, we're talking about the distribution of power and the restoration of the integrity of place by which I mean parish, by which I mean village, by which I mean city, that these are right objects of political power. So that's the concept of, of subsidiarity. And the, and the next concept, beginning with S, because Isaac, I am aware that I'm running out of time, um, is solidarity, which is ultimately we share a fate as a political community the burdens and benefits, as they like to call, are shared and ultimately, ultimately, the rich have to make sacrifices for the poor. There is a preference for the poor in this mix within the framework of solidarity. But once again, all of this is mediated because of the reflections. So many sins in my inheritance, as well as many sins in my life, but one of them is 
as a repentant socialist, I have to repent of the sin of centralised state power and the effects that it has. So the operating concept is of the common good, of a balance of interests. But within that, what we have to recognise when I talk about the 1% and the 185% returns to capital and returns to labour, that the worker and the poor have been eliminated from the common good and need to be restored. So that takes its place in forms of worker representation on boards, that takes its place in the form of the endowment of regional banks to restore integrity and capital to local areas, that takes its place in the form of the establishment of vocational colleges. I'm just saying these are the non-abstract forms um, of, of how I think. So we've got the status of the worker, that's one aspect that is of absolutely central importance. And then you've got subsidiarity, the decentralization um, of genuine power. Now that doesn't mean that you don't win or lose. That, I mean, when I talk about power, that's the democratic power that needs to be restored in those places. Then you've got this concept of solidarity, which is ultimately a status concept whereby the politics you have um, means that under globalization, if the rich didn't like it, they just move their money out or they move out. We don't have to accept this. They have great benefits of being here, so there's got to be a common good negotiated within that. And the fourth one, which I might go into, is it goes back. So if human being is not a commodity, according to, to my faith, then nor is nature a commodity, strictly speaking, to be exploited and maximised. That we have to be effective stewards of our environment. Now, within that, I have tremendous fears about certain aspects of the environmental movement which strike me as authoritarian and totalitarian. In lo so we've got to think as people of faith, as people... <laughs> so my definition of a progressive is someone who can't imagine that they have ever committed a sin. Right? That's, my, that's my lifetime reflection on that matter. They're always right. And you're always wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's one of my oldest jokes. It's the last thing you want to hear when you go to the doctor, isn't it? It's progressive. But, <laughs> but it doesn't seem to stop them. Um, however, what we mustn't do is turn away from our obligations to nature because of that, but pursue a politics that gives stewardship to local communities over their natural environment that's linked to subsidiarity and things like that. Uh, you know, I've got a lot more to say, but um, I'll, I'll begin with, with just begin to conclude, there we go, with just uh, three reflections. Um, the Sabbath day, so uh, I couldn't, the elimination of a day of rest, so if, as far as I'm concerned, standing before you as a Jew, the greatest contribution that Jews made to the world was the Sabbath day, right? A day where you don't work. A day when you can defy, completely defy the princes and the earthly powers and say this is a day to God, this is a day to the family, this is a day of rest. So once again, Isaac, thanks for two hour lunch. That was hugely appreciated and consistent with my views on the Sabbath. But to restore a Sabbath day, a fixed Sabbath day, so it's not a day on your rotor that can switch around the week. I think it's a very meaningful political thing to talk about Sabbath day observance and to restore that. Um, the second thing also uh, following uh, what Soreb said today is that the transformation of cast the insight, what in Rerum Novarum, which was 1889, the first Catholic social thought, encyclical, what was this new thing? Where in the I mean, what is this new thing? And this new thing was capitalism, was this power in the world that could commodify you, that could turn you into a commodity that was just completely at prey of market forces. And this beautiful thing emerged, it's kind of a miracle, emerged uh, Manning here, von Kettler in Germany, 
Pope Leo the Thirteenth in Rome. Honestly, when it came out, it was shocking. It was a really shocking document. Um, but something about, and deep in that was a coalition between, and I don't mean this in party political terms, between Labour as a factor of production, between workers and the church to preserve human life. So there's many paradoxes in this that we have to live with. The first is, is that the inheritance, as I receive it, is simultaneously very conservative and very radical, that those two are not opposed. That is very radical in defying the distribution of power, is very radical in looking to the leadership of the poor, is very radical in trusting democracy and particularly local democracy, but it's also very conservative in saying that the meaning of life is found in love, in family, in friendship, in relationships, and in the fulfillment of your work in a non-oppressive, non-exploitative and meaningful way. So just to say there's no easy road, the dominant powers, as we can see, are firmly entrenched, which is there's no alternative to either money power, capitalism or the state. But we have to restore the institutions of reciprocity and of society. And the blessing that we have is this incredible teaching that we receive from the church through Catholic social thought. So thank you.